And we're live. <laughs> uh, welcome, Internet, uh, to Christ the King Lutheran Church. And I'm Pastor Kevin Yoakum, and this is our uh, basic Lutheran teachings class. And as I do every week, I remind you guys, this is the book that we're using, Luther's Small Catechism. And it says down here, with explanation. In other words, the catechism uh, really is the first 40 pages or so. And then all this back here is the questions that help us study the catechism and Bible verses all over the place. And that's where we're that's where we get the meat of this is to see the Bible verses that back up this, you know, because this is you want to call it a Cliff's Notes or, uh, you know, this is a Bible study of the Bible. And then here's the extra um, verses that help us see where that's going. So uh, we are tonight uh, talking about the Lord's Supper which also has many other names, uh, right? What else would we call this? The Last Supper. Uh, the Lord's Supper. Uh, the Last Supper, that would kind of refer to the one that Jesus started it all in. Right. The Sacrament of the Altar. Did I hear another one? Yeah. The Eucharist. Did you say communion? I think. Uh, uh, the Lord's Table. Uh, breaking of Bread. Uh, and uh, each one of those kind of has a reference in the Scripture to why we would use that name. Um but that's our topic for tonight, and if I can remember, I'll look at all your faces and not just the camera all the time. Uh, when I do my Tuesday class, I have to just stare at the camera and pretend someone's watching. So, <laughs> All right, let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have brought us here tonight uh, for our fellowship and for um, being able to discuss the basic Lutheran teachings and tonight the Lord's Supper. We pray that you would direct our discussion, uh, guide our questions and the answers that you would help me to have for every question. And we pray that you would bless this time uh, to your or to our benefit and to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So we are on page 322 in uh, the Catechism, taking a look at the sacrament of the altar. Uh, in the Lutheran Church, we have two slash three sacraments all right so the most obvious two sacraments are baptism and the lord's supper. baptism and the lord's supper we say that a sacrament is a something that is a an act or a, you know a sacred act that is instituted by christ commanded by christ uh, that brings with it the the promise of the forgiveness of sins and is uh um tied to a material element, you know, a physical element. So like with baptism, it would be the water and God's word. And and so with the Lord's Supper, what what is God's word and? The element would be bread and the wine. The, the bread and the wine, right? And uh, so we'll, and we'll, we'll get to that very quickly here. But uh, so to read the, the stuff in the box there on page 322. So what is the sacrament of the altar? It is the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ under the bread and wine instituted by Christ himself for us to eat and drink. All right, so automatically what we're saying is with that bread and wine, we are receiving the body and blood of Christ, just like he said. And, and uh, he, he gives it for us to receive, right, that if for us to eat and drink. So it says, where is this written? The holy evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and, not John, St. Paul, uh, write, Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Okay, so uh, the Lord's Supper is recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and 1 Corinthians. And that's why it says St. Paul. And uh, so what we have here and what I say on Sunday is... Uh, I don't uh, a conflation I think is a bringing together of all the different uh, parts and it is I mean if, if you really want to do it you can look at the texts for each book and you see this one mentions this but that one from Luke doesn't mention it but it mentions something else 
and you know and so you see when you bring them all together all the different parts that uh, Jesus did mention uh, I think I mentioned on Sunday uh, or maybe I didn't you know when uh, it's recorded and it's slightly different in different Gospels it doesn't mean one's right it means the writer under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit only recorded certain parts of it in his in the book that he was guided to write you know but we can see them all together as you bring them together okay mm -hmm. now uh, before we get started two things uh, the sacraments baptism and the Lord's Supper is one of the quickest ways to discern differences among denominations uh, one of the quickest ways to say how is that church different from my church uh, maybe you'd say well what do they say about the sacraments you know uh, is it a testimonial? Is it a memorial? Is it the real presence of God's body and of the blood, body and blood of Jesus Christ? Uh, is it symbolic? You know, and, and what do what do I say is happening here? And so, just as a, a way of saying, this is where you'll find maybe the the most obvious disagreement in what we think the scriptures say. That's that's tough to say. Christians have a lot of disagreements. Now, it's obvious, but it's still kind of sad. It should be sad to say we struggle to come to a unified understanding of what these God's words are saying, you know. And uh, so that, that's where we're going to, you might find differences there. So it's the way that, that different people interpret it. Yeah, we're, we're not saying God's word is wrong. It's We're trying to understand right. what it means. and so I read it one way and I get something out of it. He might read it and get something a little bit different. Right. But on certain things in Scripture, right. you can't... There's some ways where you can go, I can see how we'd have a different understanding, and both are valid. Right. But, but in this, certain understandings just can't be both valid at the same time. Correct. Right, you know... It's either really present or it's symbolic. You know, that's one of them. And it, it is or it isn't, right? And, and Black and white. Yeah, it's, uh, so uh, so that's where we get some differences there. Yeah, and Ted? Yeah, where, where I've eldered before, it was always emphasized that we ex uh, explain it as a true body and a true blood uh -huh. of Christ. Therefore, there's no interpretation can't do that by saying true. Right. Yeah, and some sometimes people would say the very yeah. body, but it, it, it's there, right? And so, yeah, we'll get into these. It'll, all the questions will draw this out here too. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is, I, I like to do this for the Lord's Supper lesson whenever I do this, especially with the kids. Uh, but I'll do it next week. Um, I have my grandfather's World War II field altar set. Uh, so he gave communion out of this altar set yeah. uh, to the soldiers in France and things like that. And I, I, it's show and tell time yeah, when I do that. But uh, there's a big lesson today, so I'll do it next week. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, that's kind of a, uh, I, I enjoy really doing that. And I, I tell the kids, now, why is communion so important that they decided to make a case for it so that a pastor could go around to soldiers during war? And given the communion, and the United States government wanted this to happen. You know, that's that's the kid. Yeah. They, you know, they they were paying the chaplain to go give communion to people. You know, what is so important with this? And that gets them thinking, what's so important about communion? All right, so let's take a look here. Um, uh, question three forty eight: Who instituted the sacrament of the altar? This is the easy one. Uh, Jesus Christ. He is the one uh, who called for this. Uh, this is the the sheet is just a reference to what questions I'm hoping to to handle, but we're gonna follow on. Uh, I'll try I'll try harder. You guys are new. I'll try to help you. Uh, <laughs> yes, Mikey. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So uh, so Jesus Christ is the one who instituted this. That's who began this. And, and really, in the middle of the Passover meal, he changes the script and turns it from the Passover meal into this new thing. And, you know, he, uh, and to change the script of the Passover meal, uh, big deal, you know, that's a really big deal. And so it was his idea. All right, so question 349, uh, what does Christ give us in this sacrament? Christ gives us his own true body and blood for the forgiveness of sins. 
So there's that word true. Mm -hmm. So we're going to pull this out. The questions will pull this out of why would we want to say true? Like what difference, what other kind of body and blood are we going to talk about, right? And some will want to say, just to kind of get ahead of the game, symbolic or something like that. Or imaginary. They wouldn't use that word, but that's essentially what they're trying to say. Very. Yeah. Um, all right. Jump in as you has as you have questions. Uh, on the next page, three twenty four, we see question three fifty. Why do we take the words "This is my body" and "This is my blood" at face value? Right. And that's where some Christians will say he didn't really mean body and blood. But well, what would that even mean? So. Uh, uh, it says our Lord's only our Lord's words establish the sacrament. You know, it was his deal, right? They are to be taken at face value uh, because of the following. Letter A, the words, these words are spoken by Christ our Lord, to whom all authority in heaven on earth is given and through whom the universe came into existence, right? He is the creator. And when he says something, it must matter <laughs> what his words are and what he said. Yeah. So this is the infamous in America, is means is. You know, <laughs> we won't go there. Um, <laughs> back to 1998. Uh, but um, uh, this is where Jesus, when Jesus says, this is my body, and, and some Christians will say, he means represents. He means it looks like. He means it reminds you of. He means it symbolizes. And, uh, you know, the question is, well, why didn't he say that? Yeah. But he said is. Right? This is. And uh, so, okay. Uh, letter B. These are the words of a special covenant or, new te or, or testament spoken on the eve of his death. And no person's last will and testament may be changed once that person has died. You know, he says, this is the New Testament, or this is the new covenant in my blood, right? And and so uh, he is establishing a solemn, uh, I don't mean to make it, you know, funless, but, you know, a, uh, a uh, I'll, I'll just go with solemn, you know, a solemn, sacred act. And so his words are chosen specifically. Mm -hmm. And so when he says, this is what I'm giving you, uh, we're going to hear his words, right? Okay. Uh, letter C, uh, at the bottom of the page, these words recall of Jesus recall God's covenant with Israel in Exodus 24. Uh, then the blood of the covenant was thrown against the altar and on the people, giving access to God so that the elders of the people of Israel beheld, and ate, beheld God and ate and drank in his presence. In the Lord's Supper, we receive Christ's true blood of the new covenant or testament, and in it, the forgiveness of sins and communion with our God. You know, so the idea of a really the blood sacrifice brought unity with God. And so the blood was on the altar. A, a picture like a branch that's been dipped in blood and is sprinkled on the altar. And then the priest <laughs> dips it again. And sprinkles it on the people, right? You know, they go. Let's go to church. You know, don't wear. <laughs> yeah, don't wear anything. Good. Don't wear anything nice. You know, <laughs> and I don't know if it washes out all the time, right? No, um, but you know that the blood of the sacrifice was given, and now the blood of the sacrifice was seen as from the altar to the people, uh, and so that Old Testament image is kind of being shared here. Also, the the blood of Jesus sacrifice on the cross. Uh, it being given to us, thankfully not sprinkled on us, right, uh, in such a way. Okay? I thought that that's an interesting one uh, yeah. to me. Um, letter D, God's word clearly teaches that in the sacrament, the bread and wine are a communion or participation in the body and blood of Christ. So if we say, no, it's body and blood, and other, someone else says, it's bread and wine, it's body and blood, it's bread and wine, uh, well, who settles that? So uh, this verse here from 1 Corinthians 10 settles it. And the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Uh, other translations might say a communion, with a coming together, coming as one. The, the, the cup 
That's the, yeah, the first one that this verse mentions is the cup. So the wine is participating, united with, there together with the blood. And the bread is there participating, coming together, united with the, the um, body. Uh, so if you're saying, well, how do, if some people say it's bread and wine and other people say it's the body and blood, what do we say? And we say, yeah, all four, right? Because yeah, the bread and wine is obviously there. To You see it, you taste it. Um, and But God's word also promises that the body and blood are there. So, okay? He's telling you to do both. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're both are there, you know? And so... Some Christian traditions will say it's af after the bell rings, right? Uh, it's only body and blood, and it's no longer it's changed from bread and wine mm -hmm. to only body and blood. And other Christians will say it's only ever bread and wine, and it's just supposed to remind us of body and blood. It really it, that nothing happens; it's only a, a memorial act. And what we're saying is something happens because this verse says it, right? It's not just reminding, it's participating. And so really, I'm going to, I said this with baptism, it is a miracle. Something supernatural is happening in the Lord's Supper because he is uniting his uh, body and blood with the bread and wine. Okay? All right. Uh, and so letter E. God's word clearly teaches that those who misuse the sacrament uh, sin not against the bread and wine, uh, but against the body and blood of Christ. <clears throat> yeah, um, I went down the wrong too. Yeah. <laughs> and, and this is from 1 Corinthians 11 uh, that says, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of will be guilty concerning the bread and wine? No will be guilty in concerning the body and blood uh, of the Lord. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. Okay, now I, get, I want to hold off on that judgment word first also. But we will come back to the whole discussion of unworthy. But here we get to see that uh, <laughs> uh, we do see that there's bread and wine there because God's word continually, I mean, not that uh, there is bread and wine there, but that the body and blood are here and involved, not just mentioned, you know, but because you're act, if, if you're unworthy, whatever that is, which we'll get to, um, you, you're unworthy against, you know, it comes against you because of the, the body of, and blood of Christ. I kind of minced those words a little bit, not perfect. So, okay? So if it's just symbolic, then why are the Corinthians getting sick? And some of them dying if it's just symbolic. Right. You don't die from right. profaning the symbol. You die from profaning the reality. Yeah. So this is the judgment. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll get to the judgment here just real quick. It does not say you're condemned and you've lost your salvation and you're going to hell. But it, it says this judgment. And, and it, it does not suggest that like if you've done this, in an unworthy way, then you you're done. Just you know, forget being a Christian. No, uh, you know, there's no forgiveness. No, it doesn't say that. But it, it does say that there's this judgment is, and it goes on to say. So that's why some people are falling ill and dying. Um, there's there can be a consequence to uh, um, really taking Christ in uh, without faith. I mean, think of that as the, the holy thing is to take in the body and blood of Christ without faith is to say, I'm receiving something I have no belief in. But the holy God says, you just took me, right? You just received me, but you have no faith in me. So it's become uh, uh, my words, my words, not the Bible's, kind of an insult to God uh, to say, I'll take this, but it's just... I don't believe in it. You know, uh, it, it's kind of a, a slap in God's face in that way to participate in a holy act, whatever it might be. Uh, still holding back, uh, you know, holding on to your disbelief in what you're doing. So, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. So, all right. Any questions? 
All right, that was all 350. So why would we take it at face value? So 351, so what are the earthly elements used in the sacrament? Jesus uses bread and wine. Uh, okay, so anytime it'll say the fruit of the vine or something like that, there's no reason that we would say, oh, it's grape juice like Welch's, <laughs> right? Uh, in that time, they had no way to stop the fermentation of grapes, uh, right? Grapes ferment. That's just what they do, right? And so if you're having the fruit of the vine, it's becoming wine the minute you make the juice, right? And so whatever the fermentation process is, I'm, I'm not smart on that. But uh, the fruit of the vine was always understood to be wine because you could not have non-alcoholic juice. Uh, you could not have non-fermented grape juice until Welch came along and invented this stuff about a hundred years ago or more. Um, and uh, so, you know, anybody who says uh, we take communion with grape juice, oh, well, what did Christians do before Mr. Welch? You know, <laughs> um, yeah. They, uh, so I don't mean to, you know, throw arrows at them, but I'm right. Okay. Um, uh, but you know, so anytime it will say the fruit of the vine, it's wine. And so if, if we have a question of, uh, you know, was it really wine or, or grape juice? Well, it had to be wine of some degree because there was no way you could stop it from doing what grapes do until the 1900s or whenever Mr. Welch invented his little process of halting fermentation. Okay? All right? Now, I've seen that note on page 326, and it's like I'm... I'm Remembering back when I was a kid, when they would, if I remember correctly, they used to give the kids grape juice because they didn't want to give them wine. Uh huh. So, you know what I'm uh, saying? Yeah. Because they're worried about the alcoholic content. Uh huh. So, yeah. <laughs> so they're bending the rules a little bit, you know, because who wants to give a four year old kid, you know, right. wine, right? Well, I don't either. So, <laughs> um, but also, uh, yeah, and I went to a church that served grape juice and goldfish, uh, and uh, nice. they they were not a, a Lutheran church. They were not a sacramental That's church. They didn't hold to the view of it. So, you know, they thought we got to give the kids a little treat. Everybody else gets one. <laughs> well, we don't go up there for you know munchies, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, mid-service snack or anything. Um, so anyway, yeah, uh, yeah. So it is bread and wine. Uh, okay. All right, so the next page on 326, uh, 352. How then are bread and wine in the sacrament, the body and blood of Christ? And uh, you could stop after like the first six words or so. <laughs> By the power of Christ's almighty word. You could put a period there. Bingo. Right. You know, how does God do this? He said it, right? And uh, this is, you know, how does God create a universe? Into he, yeah, he said, I want a universe, right? <laughs> he said, let there be light. And then he kept going from there. Uh, and so when God speaks, right? Do you guys remember E.F. Hutton, yeah. right? When E.F. Hutton speaks, people listen, right? When Jesus speaks, things happen. You know, his word does things. Uh, so by the power of his almighty word, he gives us his true body and blood in, with, and under the consecrated bread and wine. This union of bread and wine uh, bread with his body and wine with his blood is called a sacramental union. So if anybody says to me, how does this happen? W one way I can answer it is because Christ says it. He says it so. But then if they still say, how does it happen? Like now they're wanting to say, how could this scientifically be possible? Uh, then my answer is, it's not scientifically possible. <laughs> it's a miracle, right? <laughs> and, and uh, you know, that's the hard thing for the, the people who hold on to science. I'm not trying to insult them, but they then have a hard time acknowledging that we have a God who does supernatural things. And we can't comprehend. Right. We no, can't we science can't. this, right? We can't. We can't comprehend. And, and if another way to say this, if, if they say, how does this happen? I don't know. Yeah, I like that answer. I just yeah, like having fun. Cool. Like, he, he says it, and it happens. I don't understand it, but it doesn't, yeah. right? You know, how does a plane fly? Yeah, my answer is, 
I don't know. It drives real fast and it's up in the air, right? Um, and I don't, I don't understand it. Flies it flies when I'm in it. I'm yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm just glad it does fly. Yeah. You know, um, and and so if they want me to work out the science of it, I can't, and I won't, right? It's because God doesn't. Jesus doesn't record how this happens. Yeah. He says, "Here it is," and he says, "Take it," right? And so you're either going to take it or you're going to not, and you're not going to believe it, right? Uh, so okay, so the best we can do is call it a sacramental union. He unites it because he calls it to be united. Uh, I think so many people they they try to intellectualize it. They want to understand in their mind how this could be. Yeah, it can't be determined in that method. It has to be taken by faith. Yeah. Jesus said it. I believe it because he's, this is my body. Right. This is my blood. I don't have to understand that I see wine and it's bread. Right. It's Jesus said it. I believe it because everything that Jesus says is true. Yeah. Okay. And, and so you know that's the really the only answer we can give, and it might not be what they want to hear. It, he makes it happen. That it's a miracle, and that's what we're saying. You know, and I. So miracles, by kind of by definition, defy science. Um, they're outside of the rules of science. Uh, okay, you guys. It's it's not it's not logical. So yeah. people that that deal strictly in logic, okay, yeah. we just have a hard time with that. It's like I have a problem with you know, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Them all being the same, but they're all one. I'm like in my mind, it's like no, that's not logical. Mm -hmm. They're they're either three people or they're not. Right. Remember that was one of my early uh -huh. discussions when I first came here. Everybody's like, "No, Mike, you, you got to take logic, and just throw it out the window." Right. Okay, this you have to believe this. Uh -huh. You know, you just have to accept it because that's what it is. Even wisdom can't comprehend exactly. it. Exactly. Right. We don't have the mind because of our sin nature to understand these things, so we have to take it by faith. Right. Yes. And right. you know, the whole gospel is about faith through God's grace. That right. Is and then we're sanctified set apart. Yeah. One of the verses from Isaiah, God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. I think higher than you. Right? Uh, okay. So let's take a look here. Um, so 253, uh, do all communicants receive the body and blood of, of the sacrament, whether or not they believe? Uh, good question. Because a believer could say, I didn't receive that. And we would say, yes, you did. Yes, because Christ's word, not our faith, establishes his bodily presence in the sacrament. However, only those who believe it receive it to their blessing. Right? So you can deny that Christ has done this and that he has said this, but it doesn't change the fact that when Christ says it, it's that's the reality. Uh, I, I don't know that I have a perfect example here, um, but let's say... Someone gets arrested, and they're being hauled off. They've got the handcuffs on them, real handcuffs, not camera handcuffs like a couple weeks ago in the news. But anyway, you know, they're being arrested, and they're putting in jail, and the guy says, I'm not arrested. Hmm. Well, you can deny it, but the reality is you are, right? Yeah. Yeah, you know, you're denying something, but it is. It, so Christ's word establishes the sacrament, not whether I believe it. It is it whether you believe it or not, Okay. So, uh, question 354 at the top of 327, all these numbers. Uh, so, what command does Christ, what does Christ command when he says, this do in remembrance of me? It's a little long here, I'll try to emphasize. Uh, Christ commands in these words that this sacrament be administered in his church until the last day. In this sacrament, here's, I think, one of the money sentences. His saving death is proclaimed and the fruits of his atonement are distributed for the forgiveness of our sins. Uh, you know, so what's he saying when he says do this? So that we can proclaim his death uh, and what good was it for us? Here, the forgiveness of sins given in the body and blood of Christ. All right? Uh, I'm, I'm going to leave the rest just for time's sake. Okay? So we go to 356. We kind of addressed the other 355. So on page 328, question 356. 
Why are Jesus' words always spoken over the bread and wine by the pastor? So, um, <clears throat> this is an important question. Some people would say, what happens if pastor doesn't speak? Because, now, just in the odd circumstance sometimes a pastor has not spoken the words of the, of the institution maybe by sheerly forgetting or by some you know in my opinion uh very sad oversight you know uh but i'm not trying to just say maybe there's a for whatever reason a glitch in his brain and he just missed it right he missed that part of the of the surface you know oh i skipped from page two to page four right <laughs> uh, okay well without jesus words there would be no sacrament for it is by the power of his word that he gives us his body and blood and then it goes on to say uh, in the administration of the holy supper the words of institution are to be publicly spoken or sung before the congregation distinctly and clearly everybody should be able to hear that, right they should in no way be left out for the elements of bread and wine should be consecrated or blessed for this holy use so that Christ's body and blood may be administered to us. This indeed happens in no other way than through the repetition and recitation of the words of institution. All right, so it would not be for me at all to paraphrase, to kind of go, oh, you guys remember what this is? This is body and blood. Come and get. It. No, let's hear the words from the scripture. Let me, that way nobody should doubt because I. I used all the words and I didn't leave anything out. I didn't kind of, um, you know, from the hip kind of come up with my new way I want to say it or anything like that. That like, I want to hear God's words so I know the word of God was present at, at the, for this bread and wine. So there's no doubt. Because that's the worst thing for a Christian is doubt. Mm -hmm. And so a pastor needs to do his job and do it, you know, word for word uh, so that there's no doubt. Okay? All right. Uh, question 357. Are communicants to receive both the body and the blood of Christ in the sacrament? Uh, yes, all communicants should receive both this consecrated bread and cup, since Christ said, take, eat, this is my body, and drink of it, all of you. Uh, so both are offered, and so ordinarily, uh, ordinarily, everyone would receive both. And this is you know, a very historic question for the Roman Catholics, where they would offer the body but not the blood. Um, do I have that right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. the body but not the blood. Yeah. And so Martin Luther said, and I'm not just trying to make Martin Luther a saint, he already is. Um, but no, anyway, uh, you know, he was saying, we receive both because Christ gave both. And his words say, receive both. Why right? Would you, yeah, why take, would you deny, take, why would you take, deny the wine? in the congregation when the priest is the only one drinking it. Most Catholic churches don't give the wine. There's probably 1% of them that would actually give the wine. That's like, like how do you change Christ's institution and say both the bread and the wine are, are under under the bread. You don't really need the wine. What do you mean? So, um, uh, internet, please forgive me. I'm going to speak candidly here. Um, uh, as I understand it, they're, they philosophize and they, they've made a way. All right. So, and now this is historically, and then I'll speak to Vatican too. But historically, they would say, well, if you get flesh, there's blood in the flesh, right? You know, you get some flesh, there's blood in the flesh. And so, if you get the the bread, you're getting the body of Christ, and it must have the wine in it, or it must have the must have the blood in it because flesh comes bloody, right? <laughs> There we well, go again, trying that, to apply a lot. Right, let's talk in circles here. <laughs> that's man. Uh, let's talk man in circles. And, and I think I have heard. So, internet, I'm just, I'm acknowledging I might be wrong on this. Um, that uh, one of the practical reasons is well, someone might spill, and we don't want to spill the blood of Christ. Oh well, um, just to have a little bit of fun with this. Do you know what Martin Luther did when he spilled some wine, consecrated wine? He licked it up. Uh, he, he figured this wine was to be received and taken, so he didn't. No, I, I don't know what I will do if, I, if this happens. You know, <laughs> um, but uh, it was you know him. Uh, everybody was watching, and he decided this is supposed to be drunk, so he licked it up, uh, and that was his way of 
making sure that the wine that was given to be drunk, consecrated, uh, and received uh, was. Now, you can say, I think Luther might have gone overboard on that. You can have an opinion on that. But that was his opinion on how to treat the wine. Uh, you know, it. Yeah. And it was a holy thing, and God gave it for us to, to drink. It used to, to be receive. like that in the Catholic so. Church. When I, you know, when I made my confirmation, mm -hmm. I received the bread and the wine. We received the bread and the wine. And then and I went to a funeral years later, and all of a sudden, there's no wine anymore. Only the priest has. Like, so, you know, what happened to the so, sacrament? And I could be wrong on this historically, but the Vatican II, which took place in the early 60s, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, it was one of its changes, modernize, well, modernizing, was to say everybody can receive the bread and the wine. And but a lot of people have refused that. Even still today, it's kind of a battle in some churches where the priest would say, "I don't, I don't want to give out the wine. You know, I want to do it the old way before Vatican II." And there might be some people who say. I don't want to receive the wine. I'll just receive the bread. It's just and, being laden uh, by the church not giving out well, the wine. I, I can't. I, that's an opinion, Internet, but spoken by a guy that you can't find or identify. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, so whether it's lazy or not, I, I'm not going to speak to that. Well, well uh, not lazy. It's inconvenient because it takes longer to get the wine. Uh, oh, maybe so, yeah. Which is a shame. It really is a shame. Okay. So any other questions? Okay. Uh, question 358. Let me, oh, yeah, go ahead. Uh -huh. If there is wine left over. Oh, yes. Sorry. Go for it. I'll answer it. What happens to that wine? Normally, I see a lot of pastors, or I see pastors, drink it down to the bottom of the cup uh -huh. when they're finished distributing it. So the disposal of leftover consecrated elements is, uh, a, a, is a question. Now, I'm not going to, no, I'm kidding. Um, uh, 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 so how you deal with what's left over is a, kind of a question of how do I treat something that at least once was the body and blood of Christ? Right. We are not told if it ever stops becoming the blood, body and blood of Christ. Mm -hmm. And so what do you do with it? Right. And, and so there are different views on how it should be disposed of. And one view is it should be consumed. And so you may at some point see pastor, even up at the altar, finishing the chalice. Right. You might see at some point pastor or responsible people in, in the sacristy after, after the service finishing the remains. And, and because that this was supposed to be consecrated to be consumed. Uh, and so that would be some people's... Uh, highest practice and I'm not uh, you know it, it's a practice of faith they're believers and that's what they they think is a, an appropriate action I think it's an appropriate action what we do here is we um, however you want to say it we pour it out on the ground uh, so we give it back to to nature to God's nature uh, and that has been historically also an acceptable practice um, historically, by not biblically historically, but man historically. Right. right. There, there's no biblical. Right. I have never seen it. Uh, reference to what to do with what's left over. Yeah. Yeah. So we have to. Uh, this this may sound tricky. You have to infer. Right. What's the best way I can by faith deal with this? And some will say, consume, because we've given we've been given no other option. Right. And others will say. And, you know, consume. You know, that's a lot for me, one person, to right. take. The priest, I, I'm not going to finish half a chalice. You know, I, I don't mean to be disrespectful. No. So afterwards, here the the uh, altar guild uh, pours out the wine onto the ground, um, and the consecrated wafers are saved for to be used next week. Or whatever. That's a question too: is what do you how do, you do that? Um, and uh, so, okay. Okay. So, quick story. Um, the youth, the LCMS youth gathering that happens every three years, and uh, this summer it was just recently in Houston. Uh, so you gather about 20, 25,000 high school, you know, Lutheran youth, and you're in a place like the um, the hockey stadium or someplace like that, and you you know you're filling the stands with Lutherans, and you're giving out communion to 20,000 people at once. So you have 200 pastors 
uh, administering communion in one service at the same time, you know, and, they, and so there'll be 200 communion stations. Uh, and um, when we, uh, at the Tampa Convention Center, when the LCMS convention was here, there was no ground close by to, you know, you'd have to walk three blocks to find grass, yeah. you know, yeah. and, and so it was requested afterwards if some pastors or, you know, faithful Christians that pastors could say they're not just going to toss back a bunch, could help consume the remainder. And and so uh, there's me and uh, some other people. There were four of us from Christ the King that were there, and we helped consume, but we got each of us to our stopping point to say, you know, to take any more would be, uh, you know, bad physically, and then it would be irreverent, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, but there there were just a number of faithful Christians trying to faithfully consume the consecrated elements afterwards. And so you're not just you know tossing back because it's consecrated. And so you're trying to. It, it became kind of a, a personal moment to say you know it's not a race. You know <laughs> no it, nothing's irreverent like that. But to still reverently consume what was remaining. And uh, but I just got to a point where I said I. I can't do this reverently anymore. It'll be, uh, you know, a challenge to me to drink that much. You know, there, there's plenty to go around. That was the thing. Um, anyway, uh, okay, so that's just a little story. Okay. All right, all right. Um, uh, how often, did we get to that 358? How often are we to receive the sacrament? Christ has not specified a particular timetable, but invites us to come often to this sacrament on account of the gifts he bestows here and our great need. In the the New Testament, the sacrament was a regular and major feature of congregational worship, not an occasional extra. And in the next sentence, this practice continued in the church and in Reformation times, our church, the Lutheran church, celebrated the sacrament, quote, every Lord's Day and on other festivals. So, uh, during the time of the Reformation, uh, they specified really to say we're not doing anything different from the Roman Catholic Church. That's where they said that there in the Apology to the Augsburg Confession, the AP. Yeah, that we do it every Sunday. Um, and really, they were saying that to show that they had not neglected the sacrament in breaking away, you know, establishing new doctrines apart from the Roman Catholic Church. Um, so it was the habit of, of the Lutheran Church at first uh, to have every Sunday communion. Uh, one of the things that happened was during the Enlightenment, you know, everybody thought they were so smart, um, uh, that it started to become not celebrated as much. But then when you come to America and you've got the frontier and you don't have enough pastors to, you had circuit riding pastors that might get to your church once a month because they have to go to eight different churches on in the, the Ohio frontier or something like that, um, that uh, communion just at one point couldn't be celebrated every Sunday. And then it just kind of became the way for, I'm just speaking of Lutheran churches, uh, um, it just kind of became, well, it's not celebrated every Sunday. And then, the, after, you know, and so for about a century, I'll say, um, American Lutheran churches did not have every Sunday communion, uh, you know, in general, most of the churches. And then it was still, I think, near the second half of the 19th century, 20th century, excuse me, the 1900s, where it started to become again to say, well, why can't we receive the Lord's Supper every Sunday? So I know uh, our, our sister church, our mother church, does not receive the Lord's Supper every Sunday. Right. But there's no command, right? So they're not wrong. We, at this church, before I came here, they were celebrating the Lord's Supper every Sunday. Uh, And they're not wrong, you know? And so uh, to kind of have a fight over the frequency of the Lord's Supper uh, is not necessary. Um, But, uh, you know, the question would be then, if someone, if the congregation wanted to move to every Sunday communion, you know, there'd be questions like, well, why, why not, right? Why couldn't we? And I'm not, I'm not talking about our mother church where they can do what they uh, deem is best at their church. 
but I know sometimes uh, a congregation uh, can really struggle with saying every Sunday, why would we do that? You know, and because they're not used to it. They grew up, grandma grew up without having communion every Sunday. And so it's a, it's a big change to, to, if a church hasn't had communion every Sunday, to go to it. It's a big change. And it, you're asking a lot of people to kind of grasp that. But it is, you know, to understand, well, what's he giving? Forgiveness. Right? And, and so do we want to do that every Sunday? Let people have this gift of forgiveness? And, uh, you know, so some will say, well, you don't have to. And you don't. But uh, others will say, I'd like to. And, and then you got a, you got a question. And this is a, it's a hard question for congregations that, that go that route to try to decide, should we change or not, right? You know, how many, how many Lutherans does it take to change a light bulb? <laughs> change? What are you talking about, right? We don't do that. <laughs> um, okay. Um, um, any other questions on that? Yeah. By true faith, we should believe that the blood and, and the body is healthy. I mean, not in the sense that, I mean, we had the COVID. Oh, yeah, 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 and I know. And, and a lot of churches backed off from giving it for, you know, right. obvious purposes. Um, but by, by question myself, you know, if I do have the true faith and I to know the Lord will be supplying me with something that is healthy and I shouldn't worry about it. Right. Now, uh, there, there might be a little, some side roads that we can take off to talk about, you know, this. But so in COVID, we tried the best we could to, sure. to make, to do, in every church, I'm just going to speak for all of Christianity, the best, no one wanted to make it matters worse, right, by doing, by having the sacrament. And so we tried the best we understood to understand what's the problem at COVID, right? What, what is the issue at hand? You know, and so how does that affect how we administer communion? Every church had to decide how to do this best. Um, and, uh, and so there is that question, you know, is, is there a germ in there? Well, uh, now I, don't, I don't mean to insult anybody. No. Um, eventually, after the, the uh, COVID mania starts dying down and we kind of you know, went back to doing what we could do, um, and I don't mean to insult anybody, but we kind of had to say, this is the sacrament that the Lord calls us to give, you know, to distribute as a church and calls Christians to receive. Now, is there a germ in there? Ooh, so, uh, uh, if there's a germ in there, alcohol kills germs. And the strange thing about uh, gold and alcohol is it sometimes helps kills germs even more. Uh, like if you've got a golden chalice or whatever. So now I'm not going to get into the chalice versus individual cup. That's a whole other fun. That's fun. Anyway, um, <laughs> um, uh, but you know, it's the other thing is uh, well, for 2,000 years uh, we've all had immune systems, mostly, right? Now, if someone is, a, a, I don't know the right way to say it. You know, if their health is compromised, then it becomes more of a question between that person and pastor. How can we care for you? And still give you God's gifts, right? And so, what might be the thing for a person who might have immunocompromised? And and I've had um, a dear saint here who's no longer with us, who just finally had to say, Pastor, I I can't, you know, and I can't be exposed to any germs because their immune system just. And, and so, um, I, I finally had to, you know. It, they got to a point, I don't mean to, you know, but they got to a point where they could not go out because they, their immune system was just done. So I visited them, and we sat on the back porch and had a lovely time, and then you know, gave them communion in the best way I could to um, you know, hope that there were absolutely no germs that I could, to the best of my ability, you know, bring to that table for someone whose immune system was just gone. Um, so, but we, we uh, in general, we're going to say uh, we, we're not doing anything to try to make it worse. We're trying to, uh, you know, do this in as normal way as possible. We're also saying, 
Uh, we do have immune systems. You know, Jesus took it back when, you know, the, the cleanliness of that upper room was probably different than we would consider. Um, and, and so some of it is, well, we just, you know, uh, some, some things have germs. And, uh, and we do our best. Um, so did I answer your question? Yes, you did. Okay. I, and I don't mean, to, I, I know people have uh, questions about, you know, th these kind of things because we don't normally in other circumstances, you know, take food from everybody's plate, you know, and kind of a thing. Um, and so it's it's a different practice of, uh, of our faith. Yeah. Thank you. All right. I've rambled, I think, I think a little bit. Um, so let's see where we get here. 359. Do the bread and wine merely symbolize, we've kind of answered this, the body and blood of Christ? No. Um, although this is the teaching of many Protestant churches um, that would say, uh, oh, Jesus' own words clearly identify Jesus, uh, identify the bread as his body and the wine as his blood. So we take Jesus' words to mean what they say. Okay? So the next one. Uh, is the flip side of that coin, and we've kind of addressed it also. Do Christ's body and blood in the sacrament replace the bread and wine so that the bread and wine only appear to be there, but really it's all body and blood now? That And this is the Roman Catholic view. Um, so no, the scriptures testify that the bread and wine remain in the sacrament. Communicants eat and drink both bread and wine and the Lord's true body and blood in the Lord's Supper. Okay? All right? So we get to see there's some differences. Um, question 361 um, on the next page. Are the body and blood of Christ in the sacrament sacrificed again to God for the sins of the living and the dead? No. All right. And, and also, so this is a difference that we would have with the Roman Catholics. They would say they're off for every time they have mass, they're, they're sacrificing again. The, the sacrifice of Christ to God. So, you know, this is an up arrow, down arrow thing. Are, are we giving the, the Lord's Supper to God? Or are we, is it a down arrow where God's giving us the Lord's Supper? Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, the body and blood of Christ in the sacrament are the complete sacrifice offered to God once for all on the cross and are now distributed to us in the sacrament together with all the blessings and benefits that this sacrifice has won for us. And if we go to that Hebrews passage, I think, uh, a single offering he has offered for all time uh, for the, to those who are being sanctified. So the sacrifice of Christ on the cross was once for all. Uh, and that's, uh, and but now the gift of it, the gift of the sacrifice, the benefits are coming to us in the sacrament. Okay? All right. A lot of stuff here. Uh, so we, uh, the next section is uh, the catechism asks, what's the benefit of the sacrament of the altar? And in the box there on 331, uh, these words given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins show us that in the sacrament, forgiveness of sins, life and salvation are given through these words. For where there is forgiveness of sins, there's also life and salvation. Uh, when you're forgiven, you get to live in Christ. And when you're forgiven, you get to be saved. You know, it all is the package deal there. So, okay? Mm -hmm. So, 362, we get into this like we just said. Question 362, what is the benefit promised in the sacrament? And I'm going to kind of uh, short, uh, just put the short answer here. A, the forgiveness of sins. Uh, all right? Because we I've been wordy. We kind of talk about this. So you flip the next, flip to page 332 for letter B. Uh, where sin is forgiven, there is life with God now and salvation everlasting. So because there's forgiveness, now there's life and salvation. All right. And there's all these Bible verses to show this. And then you look on page 333 at letter C. As Christ gives us victory over sin and Satan in the sacrament, he strengthens us for new life in him. So this is a forward and backward or a backward and forward gift. When you receive the sacrament, it goes backwards and forgives sins, right? You see what I mean? Just kind of temporally. Uh, it forgives our past. 
the forgiveness of sins committed. And it gives us strength for the week to come, for the future. You know, so if, if gosh, if Jesus is giving me his body and blood, and it, I'm taking it inside me. And that's, that's good for life. You know, it's, uh, he strengthens us for new life in him. Uh, so that spiritual food is not just kind of covering the past, but it's giving us uh, his, his, you know, strength for the future. It's the new and everlasting covenant. It's the final covenant between God and his people. Right. And, I mean, the biggest thing is the forgiveness of sin. Yeah. I mean, everybody needs their sins forgiven. Yeah. Like, every week. Every day. Every day. Yeah. But every week. Right. Jesus reminds us those sins are forgiven. Right. You walk away going, wow. Uh -huh. That's just yeah. That's that's yeah. the game changer. Yeah. That's, what's, what's the most common symbol of the Christian faith? Cross. The cross. The where the forgiveness of sins was accomplished for us. Right. You know, where Jesus died and rose again. And so this sacrament is in, immediately tied to what Jesus did on the cross. You know, he even says here, take this blood which is given for you so that you can get the forgiveness of sins, you know, which I'm going to pour out on the cross tomorrow, essentially, you know, so it is, you, if you're receiving the Lord's Supper, you're getting what Jesus, you know, the benefit of Jesus' death and resurrection. Um, okay? All right. Pretty powerful. <laughs> uh, question 363, why should Christians be encouraged to receive the sacrament frequently? Letter A, Jesus invites and urges us to come. He says, take and eat. Uh, and so we would not flippantly say, no, oh, not this way. Right? We shouldn't. All right? If, if Jesus again says, take and eat, we should say, oh, there it is. You know, I'm going to receive God's gift that he gives us. Have I, I, did, I did the Christmas gift before, right? If you're Christmas and you have a present under the tree, you open it. Right? God gives you a or you know, family gives you a present. You go, I got a present under the tree. Yay, it's mine, right? And, and you know, we've, we've all been kids, right? Yeah, right. I got something, yeah. right? And and uh, and so when God gives you a gift, you don't say, uh, I'm not going to open this. It's a gift from God, right? Uh, I don't care. I'll just leave it. I'll get it next Christmas. Well, uh, no, you know, you, if you get a present from under the tree, you open it up. And so if, if God is giving you a sacrament and, and saying, here, come and get it. Here, come and receive these, this gift. Say, oh, the Lord's giving me a gift. I'm going to go receive it, right? All right. <laughs> uh, so that's letter, letter A. Letter B, we need the comfort and strength of Christ's forgiveness for living our new life while we are assaulted by the devil and the struggles of our own sinful nature. You know, we know next week's going to be tough. Every day. Uh -huh, right? <laughs> we know, oh, life is kind of hard. And sometimes it's hard because everything out there makes life hard. Sometimes the devil makes life hard. And sometimes I make life hard. You know? Yeah. And so why not receive God's gift to strengthen us uh, and even build us up a little bit? Maybe something, you know, will be prevented because... I'm being, you know, growing in that uh, blessing and growing in that sanctification. And maybe I'll just be strengthened for whatever comes, you know. Okay? Letter C. Uh, why should we receive the sacrament frequently? Letter C says we are united with Christ and our fellow believers in this sacrament. Uh, so that communion, that coming together in union, right? Uh, the communion. We are united with Christ. And then we have this also coming together with all who are in Christ. Uh, and so when I uh, take communion, you know, we are brought together with the, the Christians in Japan, you know, with the Christians in Nigeria or something like that, that we share. We're all part of the body of Christ. We've all received the body of Christ, right? Uh, letter D, as Christ has given himself to us so completely with his body and blood, so too, the sacrament strengthens us to give ourselves in sacrificial love and service to our neighbor. I love that idea too, not just to say, well, life is hard, you better take your medicine. No, uh, now as Christ lives in me, uh, kind of to say Christ lives through me, we become, uh, you know, we are built up to act as Christ would act. Mm -hmm. Vessels. Yeah, yeah. 
uh, for good works of service. Yeah, we're emissaries. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. We can, I'm going to squeeze out a few more, and then we'll leave whatever's left for next week. Lord's Supper reminds me of what we're looking forward to. Uh -huh. In that new heavens and new earth, communion with Christ. This is just a reminder of the forgiveness of sins, and that then we'll be glorified. We'll be with Christ. So it looks to that. This is what keeps us until that day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Christ returns for that. For Prepares us. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. One of the, one of the it words. Keeps us focused. One of, one of the words in the liturgy is it's a foretaste of the feast to come. Right. right? We're getting you know an earthly sample of what God has promised for eternity. Yeah. Hey, this is amazing. Uh, the the great heavenly feast in Scripture is described. You, you get the richest fatty foods, right? And in America, you know, we don't, I don't want fatty foods. Well, we're actually, but you know, kind of know the fat brings taste, right? Anyway, um, you know, but especially in a an earlier society where luxury, the luxuries of having food just brought brought to you wasn't available. The fat was the that was that was the rich stuff. That was meant you could afford to have a fatty animal, not just a scrawny little goat or something. You know, and so you know the fattest of foods and the richest of wines. You know that this heavenly feast is awesome. You know beyond description, and so us being able to receive, you call that bread, right? Uh, uh, you know, a little piece of bread and then uh, the wine, uh, wine to say he's also you know he, this is what he gives me now, and he's promised me so much more. But yeah. it's just a reminder. This is just a. Reminder. Mm -hmm. Body and blood, and then you'll have the same. Right. Yeah. So let's get through a few more questions here. Um, question 364 is oh, oh, okay. So we got a new box here. Uh, how can bodily eating and drinking do such great things, right? How do, how do I get these great gifts? Certainly not just eating and drinking do these things, but the words written here, given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. These words along with the bodily eating and drinking, are the main thing in the sacrament. Whoever believes these words has exactly what they say, forgiveness of sins. So can can Jesus forgive sins without bread and wine? Yes. Yeah, he does in his word. But does Jesus give us and tell us to receive this, and also in this way you'll receive the forgiveness of sins? It's what he does. Why does he do it? I don't know. Not my problem. His, you know. Um, but he does it, and he says, "Come here, come get this, and receive the forgiveness of sins." Uh, and so he could do it just with words, but he chooses also to do it in a way that is tangible for us, that is tasteable for us. Uh, okay. Uh, so I think we got. Uh, uh, Question 364 was saying it's the words of Christ uh, that we receive this. You know, when he says it, that's what comes. So question 365, does everyone who eats and drinks the sacrament also receive the forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation? Nope. Uh, yeah, so no. All who eat and drink in the sacrament receive Christ's body and blood and are so offered the benefits he has promised but it is only through faith in Christ's words that we receive the benefits offered in our Lord's testament. So you can take the Lord's Supper as an unbeliever. Actually, we try not to we try not to let unbelievers take the Lord's Supper for their sake, right? Why I wouldn't want them to receive a holy thing if they're not ready to receive it. Right? But if an unbeliever takes the Lord's Supper, he does receive the body and blood of Christ. But it could be bad for him. You know, it doesn't bring a benefit to him. Just like, uh, name a good medicine. A good medicine. Just pick cod, cod liver oil. Cod liver oil. Cod liver oil. Okay. Uh, <laughs> is it bad for some people? Okay. All right. Let's go. All right. So I'm going to, I'm going to direct this. Uh, that's not a good answer. That's, that doesn't help me. All right. Um, let's say penicillin, right? It's a good medicine. Can everybody receive it? No. no. Some people are not able to receive it. 
And so if a doctor says, here, take a, take a drink of this, take a drink of that, you know, and doesn't say, oh, by the way, it's penicillin, and the person would go, oh, I'm allergic to this, right? No. If, if they didn't know what they were getting, and they just uh, down the cup, they're, they're in big trouble. Right. Because they can't take penicillin, but they just did, right? Mm -hmm. So if an unbeliever comes up to the altar and doesn't know what he's getting, and the pastor doesn't care what he's given out, then he might be handing out something with consequences to an unbeliever, you know? So, I mean, just in a way that a doctor can't just say, medicine for you, medicine for you, medicine for you, you know, because who knows if it's the, the right medicine for you, right? You're not ready to receive every medicine. Uh, and uh, in such a way, uh, the unbeliever might not be ready to receive, well, isn't ready to receive a gift that he doesn't have faith in. You know, okay. So, question three hundred and sixty, and here's where we'll stop. Or see, three hundred and sixty-six. How then should we eat and drink the Lord's supper? We should eat Christ's body and drink His blood, confidently believing that He was delivered for our offenses and raised for our justification. Trusting His saving work, we receive His body and blood given to us under the bread and wine as a guarantee of our forgiveness. If you wanted to answer that in two words, how should we eat and drink the Lord's Supper? In faith. And, and uh, you know, that to say, we believe his promises. Right. We receive, we understand what he's giving to us. And if, if we don't have faith, or, or we're struggling with that, maybe we can talk to pastor and say, well, tell, let's go work through this thing again, because I need to hear it again, or whatever. You know, tell me the promises of the Lord's Supper. And, you know, because if I'm saying, I don't believe it, I think it's just a bunch of hoo-ha or something like that, then I'm saying, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, maybe just enjoy the music right now and don't come up to the Lord's Supper or come up and I'll give you a blessing or something like that, right? So if someone doesn't know, uh, that would probably be not the right time for them to come to communion. So, okay? All right? All uh, right. You, you know, if you see a bunch of people in line getting shots, you don't just walk in line, right? <laughs> I'll get a shot, why not? I don't mean alcohol, I mean, a, you know, medicine, an injection. You know, just I'll take an injection. Uh, of what? You know? Uh, and so you usually should find out, is this going to be something good for me? Do I want to receive this? Right? It, some people opted not to take the vaccinations, right? I'm not promoting or, do, you know, I don't, we don't need to open that. Some people received the vaccinations and some people didn't because they said, you know, maybe I don't want it, right? So we would not just blah, give out the sacrament without saying, this is what it means. And if, if, you, if, you, if you're not ready to believe in this, then probably don't receive it, right? Um, okay? Are you saying that they would be cursed? No. Uh, but it would be of no. I mean, uh, well, what we said earlier is that there would be uh, judgment, but whatever that judgment is, is sometimes unclear. But I would not want them to receive it, which is the next part that we'll have to get to next week, in an unworthy way. Right. So, uh, this is also to say maybe some kids aren't able to do something that adults do, they're just not. You're not ready for it, you know, whatever. And and so to receive it without faith uh, may bring a consequence, because that's what First Corinthians 11 has said. There were some who received a, a judgment, a sickness or something. Uh, I, w I would not use the word curse because I don't think the scripture doesn't use it, so I'd be hesitant to use it. Yeah. Um, but uh, it, it might be, you know, to say... You, do you, by doing this, are you confessing that you are a believer in Jesus Christ? No. Okay, well then don't do this, right? Right. I wouldn't. I I just try to find certain comparisons. So this may not be a perfect comparison, but I wouldn't ask a Canadian to sing the American national anthem, right? They're not American, right? I wouldn't ask a Canadian to sing it if they didn't, you know, at the ball game or whatever. They they have their you know, when we play Montreal or whoever. Canada, yeah. yeah. And so, you know, and, and we don't need to sing a God Save the Queen. It, it's not it's not our country, right? And, and just recognize that's theirs and that's good for them. But, uh, you know, in the same way, uh, I would also not ask 
a non-Christian to act like a Christian if they ha didn't have the faith. Right. And, you know, because some some would without understanding, and they would say, "What did I just do?" Right? And some would not, and and they'd say, "Stop making me, stop trying to make me into a Christian." Okay, well, then don't come to communion. Right? Don't, don't force me to do it. Did I answer your question in any good way? That's close enough. Okay. <laughs> I try. Um, <laughs> any other thoughts or questions at this time? I just want to say, I think also the, the communion is a refocus on the Lord. Yeah. yeah. If, you, if you have to do it because of everything that's going on, we have to focus, get our balance again. Right. It's, it's like coming back to the cross. Uh, and I, uh, me, as a teenager, you know, I was like any other teenager, right? You know, you're struggling with life. And oh, by the way, I'm still struggling with life, right? But anyway, me as a teenager, you know, you get life goes astray, but then you come back to communion and you're like, whoa, I was doing things wrong, you know, and to remember what communion is. And that's kind of where you go, oh, I have to. Once again, Lord, thank you for this gift, and please prevent me from doing that again. You know, whatever that is for any of us, right? And so it's kind of like that that course correction, like refocusing or re, you know using the compass to point north again. You know, to get us back pointed the right way. Yeah. All right. Well, dear internet, uh, this is where we close in prayer, but we don't put our prayers up on the internet. It's none of your business. Uh, so um, we're going to say good night and uh, we will, uh, but uh, we might be praying for you. Um, but we will uh, sign off now and then we'll close in prayer here locally. Good night.